Hi, Meg. Thank you so much for being here. Hi, Alvaro. Great to be here. Absolutely. I just wanted to start off and, and giving my major gratitude for, for writing this book, this new updated book, and, and just putting into focus an under-researched area um, for what happens in our 20s, which, you know, I presume needs a little bit more work, but you've, you've started off and, and you're helping us out a whole lot. I want to start off with this first question, and it's uh, really, do you think this gap in, in, this, in our 20s now, which didn't exist 50 years ago, is it under threat of having adults in their 30s and in their midlife in a frustrated state, in a state of, of regret? Um, yes, uh, that doesn't mean I think the gap should go away. So the gap you're referring okay. to is that, you know, people quote, settle down later than they used yeah. to the average age of marriage is risen, home ownership, kind of getting settled in your career, those happen closer to 30 now than they do to 20. Um, so can that be a problem? Yes, if you don't sort of make good use of your 20s and get started, even though the, those things may not seem pressing. Is it always a problem? Not necessarily. Actually, the fact that there's this gap is a huge opportunity to sort of get out there and get in front of your life and get in front of big decisions and be able to really think about them and plan for them. So it's, um, it's both a danger and an opportunity. So it just depends on what you do with the time. Yeah, I see what you mean. And and after, after reading your book, it's have been helped us with a direction really for our 20s. Um, but my question is, how much can we divert from our long term path and really uh, try to create, as you said, that identity capital in things that might not be your college degree, and it might be, you know, for example, I don't know, starting a podcast, uh, and I'm right. studying, you know, law. So what? Yeah. How can you divert it? How much? Um, well, I don't think they have to be diversions. So, I mean, I, I do think that people have an opportunity to both think about the present and the future at the same, and that some things, some present piece, I mean, ideally a present piece of identity capital, such as, hey, I had this cool podcast, it did really well, mm -hmm. that that may be something that makes you happy in the here and now, but it is probably also something that's going to pay off somehow down the line that it's going to make you more interesting to job applicants or or to um to you know jobs you might be interested in or make you um lead to something else down the line that you might want to do and so i don't think we have to choose between the present and the future that we can live our lives in the present with the future in mind and kind of you know have those two things work together okay yeah, yeah absolutely and um actually i'll give you a good a, kind of a good example of something that might sound like a diversion i was giving a talk at a um, like a big consulting firm in new york pre pre pandemic <laughs> and um one of the women there was saying that she um was you know in business school but took time out at night to do this like wine tasting class which might not seem like a big diversion but people said oh you're not going to have time for this you need to focus on business you need to focus on school but she said i really need to do something for myself and that actually now that she's in the consulting field she said it's actually a great piece of identity capital because there are a lot of opportunities where you're sitting around drinking wine with people and talking shop and like she's able oh, wow. to sort of draw on that and talk about that. So it may seem like some silly thing that she did on the side that wasn't really worth anything, but it actually has ended up being kind of a nice feather in her cap. And so, so anyhow, that's an example. Yeah, for sure. Um, and, and with regards to, you know, this example, for example, with wine tasting, how, how much time do you have to be committed to it for it to really seem like identity capital? Can you just have six months of, um, of doing some wine tasting? Or do you need, as you said in another chapter of your book, those 10,000 hours to really establish you know, a skill? Well, that's a good question. Um, you know, it probably depends on what something is. So um, that 
yes, you know, we need our 10,000 hours to say, I'm really an expert in something. I didn't just kind of dabble in it for five minutes and, you know, mm -hmm. talk about it for 10 years. So sometimes that's the case. However, there are things that we do that may not last long that have um, a, kind of a lot of capital attached. So I'll give you another example. Actually, during the pandemic or where I was when uh, COVID started, I was actually teaching on what's called semester at sea. Have you ever heard of that? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was on a boat with 520 somethings in Asia, in the ocean, um, when the pandemic broke out. And so semester at sea is a great example of something that people do for three months. You can't do it for 10,000 hours as much as people honestly <laughs> wish they could. Um, you do it for three months, but it's something that people often, you know how you nodded and said, oh yeah, yeah, you know, I know what that is. Maybe you know somebody who did it or you have certain associations yeah. about, you know, people need to be really independent or courageous or adventurous, you know, to do or culturally curious to do that. So, you know, sometimes these cool pieces of identity capital we have come from something that we did a year abroad or a summer job that just has a lot attached to it. So it doesn't always have to be the 10,000 hours. Okay. I see what you mean. No, it, it really, it scares me a little bit because um, I see, you know, kind of the objectives that many of of people my age have, and it's, you know, getting into these corporate jobs, uh, getting, you know, ahead in their careers. And I kind of wanted to ask, you know, can we seize an environment that isn't the assumed corporate job? Can we, for example, you know, start off with entrepreneurship or, uh, or maybe take bigger risks? Absolutely. I mean, I would actually suggest that now is the time for that. That it's a okay, it's harder right. to take those risks it, when and if you have a partner and two kids in a house, if that's your thing. Um, that your twenties are the time to take the professional risks and to do things like semester at sea or the wine tasting class, wow. or you know, say I'm going to start a business and maybe it fails. But you know what they say is, you know, fail early is, you know, learn, try things, take risks, learn from that early. And it's not a failure if it leads to something else that is a success. And so um, there's nowhere in the defining decade do I intend to suggest that the best path is to, you know, go to medical school or get a corporate job or right. you know, get married and have two kids. I mean, the book is really about how it's your life, whatever you want to do with it, but whatever you want to do with it, your 20s is probably the best time to get started or try it or take risks related to it, that those things are going to get harder to do the older you get. No, I absolutely. I agree. I, I definitely think that, you know, when you have, you know, might have kids in, in your mid thirties or, uh, or have, you know, a, a money more responsibilities that, you know, it's definitely more risky to, to do those kind of things. So um, it makes me think, you know, what if you are an entrepreneur and you become extremely successful, something I didn't really see in the book, which um, I've heard that there has been studies that uh, might bring out, you know, some issues is what if you're too successful in your twenties? What happens when in your in your 30s and 40s, maybe you feel this sort of excessive high that kind of brings you into that depressive state later on? Mm, well, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting here thinking that would be a good problem to have. I'm not trying to be unsympathetic. I'm just thinking about most of my clients thinking, I hope my problem in my 20s is that I'm too successful. Um, but, you know, sure, like we all... Um, have you ever heard of like the hedonic treadmill about, about half uh -huh, yeah. yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. you're on it and you get something, you know, you, uh, let's say you, you know, get this cool pair of jeans and you're really happy about that. And it was kind of a stretch for you financially. And then you have them for a couple another of months one. and then you need the next one, right. You know, you get the iPhone, then you need the next one. So success can be like that, that, um, so wh whatever that is for you, whatever, you know, I got this REACH job or this REACH grad school program or this REACH thing happened, but then it wears off and you're sort of left with, well, what about the next thing? Because then you're comparing yourself to a group of a new, you know, a group of people that are two levels up. And so I think we all struggle with that, no matter what your you know, level of success is, is once you get one thing 
then you start already looking up and saying, well, what's next? And I'm, I'm maybe going to feel kind of bummed out if I don't keep moving up. No, it's true. It's true. And I think it's pretty relevant now because of so many young, even before their 20s, these TikTok famous people that are making these dances yeah. or the right, Instagram, right. you know, Instagram influencers. So it, it kind of brings me to the social media realm uh, of this possible conversation. How can you see that as damaging? Maybe starting off with the social pressures of that. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, I mean, when I wrote the first edition of the Defining Decade, so it came out in 2012, which means I was writing it in, you know, 2010, which means that was right around the time, believe it or not, there was a time, you know, when people had no social media accounts and it was right wow. at that time when they were signing on to Facebook, which was kind of all there was back in the day at the beginning. And I would actually see people go from, I have no social media accounts to, hey, I think I'm gonna sign up for this thing called Facebook. And then the conversations and sessions started to be, oh my gosh, everybody's life so much better than mine. And so-and-so is getting married and so-and-so is going to grad school and so-and-so has this great new job. And so it was interesting because the data, the research data wasn't out on social media when I was writing The Defining Decade, but you know they hadn't done the studies yet. I mean, it was just brand, brand new, but I could see it every single day in my practice sort of the, the qualitative data around, man, I just got a Facebook account and suddenly, you know, I feel so bad about my life. Wow. And um, so now, of course, Facebook, I realize is, you know, so yesterday, but it's <laughs> Instagram and TikTok, it's the same, you know, it's a different, different, yeah, you know, platform, is. same thing where you get on and you see, you know, people have their pictures and they're edited and they're so perfect, or they've got this cool dance and it's gone viral and they're huge. And so I think that's a lot for the brain to deal with that, even though we know, so by now the data is out and I'm not telling you anything you haven't already heard, which is that upward social comparisons make people feel bad. So if I go on my phone and I see, you know, 10 friends on Instagram who seem to be on these amazing vacations, you know, despite the pandemic, I'm going to feel bad about, you know, being stuck where I am. But we know that, but just because we know it doesn't mean our brain doesn't have to do that work. So we see it and we go, ah, oh, I feel so jealous. I feel so bummed. What's wrong with me? And you go through all that and then you remind yourself, all right, these are their pictures. It's, maybe not the whole thing, you know, I can't compare my insides to other people's outsides, as they say. But every time you look at your phone, which for many people is a lot, you have to go through that internally. That's a lot of work mm -hmm. to do every single day. So I think we underestimate sort of the difference between knowing about something and it you know, it still can have an effect on us that just because we know that looking at the cover of like a fashion magazine could make you feel bad about your very real body that's not photoshopped. Just because you know it doesn't mean that you don't sort of go through that roller coaster every time you see a cover of a fashion magazine. And this is the same thing for Instagram and TikTok um, that people kind of imagine that there are all these people out there, all these influencers, and they're making tons of money and having tons of fun and living their best life. And it's actually, I mean, really not true. That's not what most 20 somethings are doing. It's often not the whole story, but it's very hard not to have your brain take that journey multiple times a day. That's the thing, right? Like people maybe read magazines once or twice a day, and this is really making us looking at our phones with these sort of psychological tricks of us trying to check it as much as we can. Um, so how, how impactful do you think that is for people in their 20s in terms of time that they may be using for something else? Very. Well, that to me, I mean, the upward social comparison thing is interesting, but the defining decade is really a book about time and how valuable yeah. your time is, especially in your 20s, it's a very unique period and kind of time. So I'm more interested in the time piece than in the social comparison piece per se, but it's, um, you know, so I work a lot with people of, let's, let's find out exactly how much 
time do you spend on your phone? And I'll have them, you know, measure their screen time and come in and pull it out and we discuss. And um, <laughs> I'm sure it happens way too often that there's more than oh, three okay. hours plus three hours. Yes. On average. Well, that was, I was talking to a client, you know, one day and she was saying, you know, Instagram, 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 it's ruining my life. I hate it so much. And I said, well, let's, you know, figure out how much you're looking at it. So she came in and she said, okay, I figured it out. It's three hours. And I said, per, you know, really hoping, but <laughs> not knowing she wouldn't say a week, it was per day. So she was spending three hours per day on Instagram. So of, of course, you're going to feel bad about yourself. And if you don't, your brain is working so hard to counteract all the messages and, you know, sort of the contrast and the comparisons you're seeing, then you're just going to be exhausted. So um, I often tell my current clients about a client I had back in the late 90s who smoked. People, I don't know about in Spain, but in the U.S., people don't really smoke so much anymore. Cigarettes. More, more here. Huh? They still, they're still going they at do. it. Okay. So most of my clients don't smoke cigarettes. So I tell them about this client I had kind of closing in on the year 2000 was trying to decided to quit smoking. So she smoked a pack of cigarettes a day. And that's 20 cigarettes a pack. She took about, you know, every cigarette was kind of a little smoke break. So she took a, you know, five to 10 minute smoke break for every cigarette. So we're talking about, you know, up to 200 minutes a day smoking. So that's three hours just like chilling out smoking. And so I tell my clients that or my students, you know, I often tell the story in class and they'll say, oh, that's crazy. Three hours a day do it smoking. You know, that makes no sense. And then we say, well, three hours a day on Instagram, how is how is this really any different? It's, you know, it's a pretty significant chunk of lost time. So going back to the uh the semester at sea being on that last spring, there was no internet. So this was my students first experience like in their lives of never having internet. And one thing they noticed, it was like my client who quit smoking. The first thing she noticed was how much more time she had in her day. And my students all noticed, well, they noticed not needing to post, post, post their lives, just live their lives. And they also noticed how much more time they had. They were spending more time with people face to face, obviously, they had time to go, you know, do sit ups or get on the stationary bike, they hung out with friends, they did better in school, they got more sleep, they just felt like three hours had been at, like they now had a 27 hour day. And um, it, it wow. you know, they loved it. They said it was just really a gift. No, it's, it's completely refreshing. I agree. I last year I actually took a month off of my phone and switched to a BlackBerry, an old one. So oh, I, nice. I didn't even have texts. I, I had to like, because here we use WhatsApp, so I can only text people, uh -huh. and people don't text here. They use right. the the app, so I didn't. I just it was just calls. That's it, and it was difficult. But I did feel like I slept more. I, I felt more rested, and I. I had more energy to do new activities and yeah. I'm back. I, I hate to say that I'm back on social media, uh, partially because of, um, of, of this project, but also because, you know, uh, it's a great place to communicate with people uh, sure. online, but, um, sure. yeah. but it's insane. It's insane. I mean, I think it's, it's not whether you use social media, it's how, and I mean, we're yeah. just going to have to be as intentional and as, grown up about it as you would be about how do I use alcohol or how do I use other substances? I mean, it just, how do I use, you know, fast food or marijuana, like things that maybe in some doses aren't a problem, but in other doses are a problem. And so, I mean, we just have to manage it for ourselves that way. I don't think it's realistic, even though I've seen it and people tend to be happier without all that, but um, you can't live on a boat and away <laughs> from it. And when you're, you know, like you said, most of us have work or school or, you know, friends where we really need to be on social media. And so it's kind That's of true. up to us to manage it. And what if you really have this sort of dependency on communication for, uh, let's say your, your partner. So for example, um, you know, online dating and, and even online flirting, how do you see that 
uh, in the digital sphere affected our relationships uh, in our 20s? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I guess to, I'll take that in two separate directions. Okay. One direction is I see online flirting. Um, I mean, obviously, again, it's not whether you do it, it's how you do it. You know, who doesn't want to do a little online flirting sometimes? <laughs> um, it's true, it's true. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm married, so I'm kind of, maybe not me, but other people, oh, right? Okay. So, um, so. but, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. I do see clients become a little mood dependent on, you know, I need some attention from a boy or from a girl to, to lift my mood or before I can feel okay about myself. And I mean, obviously probably all be happier and healthier if we can lift our mood or feel okay about ourselves without that needing to come from other people, because that puts us in a very dependent position. Um, So I see that, you know, kind of, and again, I work with people on how do you use your phone? How do you use the sites? You know, so when do you go on? What's the experience? What's happening? How do you feel after? And again, the point isn't to get rid of the sites or the usage as much as just to be a more intentional, mindful, informed consumer. Um, So there's that piece. Um, You know, the online dating is, I mean, that's here to stay. And there's a lot of things about it which can be very efficient and um, you know, create a lot of opportunities that it was harder to kind of stumble upon, literally stumble upon, you know, 20, 30 years ago, if if you didn't meet someone you didn't literally, you know, bump into and meet. Um, So there's a lot of upsides there. What I think is interesting is that the online, I don't really see that online dating has transformed how my clients date it's just changed you know where and how they meet people and okay, there's wow. still you know you've heard the wherever you go there you are have you heard that saying <laughs> wherever you go there you are oh okay uh, i haven't um, heard of that I haven't heard of that. yeah so it's you know this idea that whether you're going into a bar or you're going on tinder you're you're bringing yourself you know you're you're you and so a lot of my clients kind of have the same sort of anxieties or insecurities or stressors around online dating or meeting that that they would be having in a bar. And so to me, I don't see them as wildly different as much as two different mediums, you know, where people are sort of getting out there and figuring out, you know, what's my value and what am I looking for? And um, so, you know, I think obviously online dating is here to stay. And again, it's not whether you use it, it's just understanding how you're using it and whether that's working for you and making you happy. Yeah, absolutely. It actually makes me think because I imagine that maybe 20 years ago, it would have been a little bit different in the sense of how many options you might have. Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe, maybe not just online dating, but the globalization effect of the past few years, I, I would think that uh, maybe it made an impact on how many people have are in relationships because they have so many options that, oh, and, and everyone's in these short-term relationships that they're, they just think, okay, I can go to this, 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 and it kind of loses that long-term effect of relationships. And I thought online dating might have an impact, but I guess not. Well, I mean, there's been some research around that, that people feel like, you know, there's always something better out there because they're always, always. <laughs> Now, whether or not that's, you know, you can have that thing or that better thing out there actually lives within driving distance of you, which does usually end up ultimately being a factor. Um, You know, although a close friend of mine just, you know, moved to Brazil to, you know, marry the guy that she'd met there online and, you know, all is well. So, I mean, you know, driving distance may be less of a thing than it used to be. But, I mean, I think there does there is that sense of there's just unlimited supply however most of my clients you know they live in one place i mean they live where they live and they tend to be looking where they're looking and you know you know unless that place is new york city or la 
you pretty quickly realize there aren't limitless opportunities <laughs> and that yeah. you know that you start going on dates and you know you realize it's you know sort of the more things change the more they stay the same that there's sort of a pool of people out there that are maybe looking for what i'm looking for and let me figure out if i you know mesh with any of them yeah and it's crazy that you know there should have there should be these conversations of meshing with people you know at, at an earlier age than we might think right because um you know i'm 21 and to be a little bit vulnerable I haven't thought about this at all. Like I have, I haven't even been in a long-term relationship yet. And, right. and it makes me think, you know, this book really made an impact on me thinking, okay, maybe I should take this seriously, at least, uh, you know, not just maybe not completely long-term, but, you know, midterm having, you know, some relationships that can last a little bit, create these important connections. Um, Yes. I mean, exactly. So you're good data point. You're 21. And 50 years ago, if you lived in the US anyway, you would be married now, like maybe even with maybe even with a kid, a baby. So, you know, frankly, I am glad those days are gone because I do think people benefit from making life's biggest decisions, such as partnership, kids, you know, those things that we kind of hope, hope, or maybe a one time thing, or, you know, that, that it's, it's not something we're going to do a hundred times before we die. And um, that those things happen a little later, I think is good. Um, it's an opportunity to do it better. Um, and doing it better means using that space in between to really get to know who you are, what you want, and to try out some actual relationships. So you find out you know, what are you compatible with? What are you not compatible with? And I mean, that doesn't mean there's no time for, you know, light fun or hookups or things that obviously aren't going anywhere. However, if you do that for 10 years and then you decide at 31, you want to be married, you actually haven't learned anything about what it is you want with that decision. And so uh, the best analogy is, the one a client used with me once and she said that she felt like her 20s were like musical chairs and that everybody was just running around and having fun and the music's playing and then suddenly around 30 people i don't think it's just societal pressure i mean people kind of start to feel like you know what i'm ready to slow down mm -hmm. a little bit and chill out and find my person and she said she felt like the music turned off and everybody started sitting down and that you know that maybe she had just sort of chosen her husband because he was the closest chair to her at 30. And that's what I really don't want for people. And so you've got this 10 years, sure, to have some fun and not worry about marriage, but also to, you know, as we said, fail early, you know, have some relationships and find out, woof, dodged a bullet on that one or glad I didn't marry that person. I thought I wanted that, but I didn't. And so to really learn. So by the time you do make that decision, it's an informed decision, not just one that's being made because you're at an age where you're ready to have a partner. No, it's completely true. I mean, it's interesting because having those mid twenties, uh, at least to really experiment in what will work in, in, in the years to come really shows sort of partly the innate things that we may desire uh, because some people in the early 20s, even their political affiliations might be different and they might even think, you know, that uh, we are in a, uh, for example, gender equal society. Like, for example, uh, you know, me a few years ago, I would say, oh, we're in a gender equal society, et cetera. But maybe once I want to settle down, I, you know, I may want to have, a supportive role or, uh, you know, right, I, I right. think I said yeah. in your book. I mean, that's really the, that's, I mean, I, as a person who, so I'm a Gen Xer, so I spent my twenties probably a lot like you're spending yours. I mean, I was, mm -hmm. I didn't even meet my husband until I was 29. And okay. so, and I got oh. married at 33. So, I mean, I'm, I mean, that's, this is Gen X, true for Gen Xers, true for millennials, true for Gen Zers. Um, and, it is true that it's difficult sometimes the way we live our 20s to even map that on to what life is going to look like in our 30s that um, I had there's a new chapter in the updated version of the book and it's 29 conversations 
to have with your partner and really with yourself. And the conversations are things that, you know, people often say, well, we'll talk about this like right before marriage, but usually right before marriage, people have already made up their mind. <laughs> so, so um, you know, I really suggest that people have these conversations earlier or just have the conversations in their head earlier. So you don't have to on the, you know, third meetup with somebody ask, you know, if they ever want to have kids and after that, are they going to want to work full time? I mean, that may not be something you want to bring up on the third date, but it, these could be questions to keep in mind of, okay, these are actually things I'm going to care a lot about in about 10 years. I couldn't care less right now, but if I choose a partner for my thirties based on my 20 something criteria, that may not match very well. You know, if your 20 something conversations are, where do you like to go out? And where do you want to go on a trip? I mean, that's all fine and good for now, but that's maybe those aren't the same questions you're going to be asking 10 years from now. So the book includes 10 questions. I mean, sorry, 29 conversations, really just to start thinking about just to cue your brain of, oh, wow, these are the things I'm actually going to care about in 10 years. It's hard to imagine, but it's true. Mm, yeah, completely. No, I, I, when I saw those 29 conversations, I was I really, uh, really impacted. It, as you said, like it created that cue um, mm -hmm. in your, in your brain to start making these conversations, which makes me think within these conversations and within our, the whole decade of, of being in our twenties, how important is the aspect of vulnerability with regards to your professional life, to your love life, to your social life, to everything. It seems that there is this necessity of having to put your, you know, dropping the ego and having to make these sort of actions that may not be, you know, within you at first. Mm -hmm. I think I know what you mean. I'm, I'm not sure, but tell me if this addresses your question. So, uh, so because the, the new edition of the defining decades coming out, you know, I'm putting out op-eds and, you know, mm -hmm. magazines and going on podcasts. And so one of the op-eds, um, they said, why don't you write a shortened version of that 29 conversations and, you know, make it an article and it'll, you know, go in a magazine somewhere. So I did that and we were batting it around with the publicity people at my publisher. And they said, gosh, you know, I don't know. I mean, those questions, I just, you know, it just seems like you might scare somebody off if you have those conversations with them. And I think they're a bit oh. talking about vulnerability there of hundred uh, percent, you know, do we have to be cool and play it cool until when, I mean, when, when is it okay to figure out what you want and tell someone and find out like they don't want that. And aren't you glad that you found that out versus I think there's a tendency, um, maybe more among women, but you tell me if you, if this rings true for you and your friends at all to just kind of do whatever you need to do to hang on to what you have rather than, um, you know, really finding out, you know, does this person really like me for who I am and for what mm -hmm. I want, or do I need to dress a certain way or act a certain way or put on a certain thing so that I keep them, you know, whether they're really the match for me or not. Yeah, I think that's a, a very person, uh, you know, it depends on the person, uh, mm -hmm. of course, as with everything, but it's, it's I think it's difficult in four generations with less um, social actions and more of them online, it's more, dif more difficult to be transparent and more mm -hmm. difficult to be authentic. But I do think that, you know, you can develop that skill of having, being able to be vulnerable, being able to have these direct conversations to really find out and be comfortable with uh, with your, your partner or whoever you're speaking with. Right. And even to, I mean, easy for me to say, because I'm not in the thick of it anymore, but, uh, and I remember absolutely, you know, feeling that way and having, you know, having those thoughts myself of, well, gosh, how honest do you really want to be? But, um, but it really to speak hypothetically with someone about, Hey, do you ever think about the future? And, you know, do, I'm not asking, do you want to marry me? You know, when are we going to do this thing? As much as saying, you ever think about what kind of life you would want 10 years from now? You ever think about 
you know, I'm not really sure why that has to be so terrifying um, to another person. I mean, that seems like, you know, and actually a very smart thing to do, even if you're just speaking hypothetically, not that you're trying to back someone into a commitment as much as just get to know what they think about, you know, what do you think about your future? What are your hopes and dreams? Okay, yeah, that's true. And, and maybe that makes me think, uh, how is your goal setting important in your 20s, especially with, exactly. these, yeah. with these aspects? Yeah, so that, I mean, that really is, I mean, if you, in the US anyway, we wouldn't think twice about somebody who had goals and aspirations and thoughts about what they wanted in their, in their 30s or 40s, um, in, you know, related to their career. And if they don't, we think, you know, get <laughs> yeah. together, you know, think about it a little bit. And, um, but it's so interesting how risky, how much more risky it is to kind of map that onto the personal, you know, to say, well, I think I might like this kind of relationship or this kind of family or this, I wanna be this kind of partner. I wanna have this kind of life um, that it seems much more taboo to have goals or hopes or dreams. And those can change, but just even the process, like you said, almost the cueing of allowing yourself to have personal or relational goals and hopes and dreams that in and of itself is is good for you yeah it's completely true and it it really is difficult because um as you said in the book we really like to live in the present when we're in our 20s right and and mm -hmm. we are scared of over planning these things of these goals that you can maybe think about later so what is really maybe if you can expand on this uh present bias uh, that you spoke on yeah, yeah. So uh, present bias is, you know, a well-studied phenomenon that I educate people about in the book. This is not my, you know, right. amazing discovery, unfortunately. But um, it's just that as humans, most of the time we're motivated by or sort of attracted to what makes us happier now more than what will make us happy later. I mean, that's, you know, that's life, right? You think, well, I'll have the ice cream now and maybe I'll go to the gym next week <laughs> or I'll buy the blue jeans now and I'll pay off my credit card later. Um, I'll go out with my buddy now and I'll study for my law school exam later. I mean, this is life right and you know this has also gotten us into trouble on bigger scales around climate and oil consumption they just a million ways where we're sort of thinking well what 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 makes me happy now what makes my life easier now it's very difficult to think into the future i mean it just is harder so we kind of have to take our brain into stretch mode to think beyond the here and now. That's normal. So that happens um, in your 20s, uh, maybe even a bit more so because the part of the brain that thinks a lot about the future is kind of just coming online or fully coming online. So there's a, a lot of present bias going on that people think about, well, the kind of partner I want forever is the kind that suits me right now, you know, or, my 20s are the time for travel and then later I'll worry about my job, even though it doesn't have to be so black and white like that. Um, so I get it, you know, present bias is normal, but what we do know about happiness and time perspective is that the happiest, most successful people um, roughly split their brain power between thinking about what makes them happy now and what's going to make them happy down the line, which makes perfect sense. I mean, you, you know those people who they're totally miserable, but one day they're going to be done with, you know, all the stuff that they're really suffering toward. That's probably not a way to live. But you also know those people who they live for the now, 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 and then at some point that catches up with them. And, you know, the things that took a little bit more longer term planning, they, they just never happened. So, you know, I think there, it doesn't have to be black and white, that your 20s are an amazing opportunity to do things you won't be able to do in your 30s, which includes travel or date casually or, right. you know, whatever. Um, but they're also a great time to go ahead and go to grad school or get started on that career or take some relationship risks and really experiment and that we can do both of those things.
Yeah. It really scares me to have a no merge between traveling and having that career. That merging is seems like it's very difficult to have, especially if you have a big job where you're working so many hours a week. Yeah, you, you know, I, I mean, I think that might be, you know, one of the benefits of the way things are changing, you know, like you were saying earlier with technology and globalization. Right. I mean, I, you know, as I said in the book, my first job out of grad school was as an outward bound instructor. So I used to basically travel and take people on trips for a living. So that's a big part of who I am. And then you know, just last spring, I, you know, closed the door on my practice for three months and went and did semester at sea and, you know, traveled with work. And I actually travel a lot um, in the summer. And then I travel for work. I've made like traveling for work part of my, you know, repertoire because I enjoy it. So I travel a lot for talks and then I'll stay where I am and spend a week somewhere. And so it doesn't have to be um so black and white where you get to travel the globe when you're in your 20s and then you're sort of stuck in an office from you know 30 to 65 i mean i, I frankly hope it isn't like that um for you or anyone else who doesn't want it to be it's true it's true and um uh, maybe this is one of my last questions uh, how important is health when regarding our 20s because perhaps you know or even just mindfulness uh, with regards to how we can really improve our 30s, because maybe we want to travel in our 30s as well, and we're preparing that, but maybe you are becoming obese or you are not Absolutely. really have a leg issue. Yeah, it's such a great question. People don't ask that enough. And as someone who's, you know, getting older now, um, so for example, I mean, one of the reasons I wanted to, you know, I went on semester at sea last year because, and my kids were with me, and we biked and, you know, my kids all snowboard, I snowboard and they do wakeboarding, mm -hmm. I do wakeboarding. And I'm really glad that I'm, you know, I'm just like barely hanging on to doing all those things. Um, but I'm glad that I have preserved my health for that um, because I'm wow. still enjoying the world and I'm still being active. And, um, and you're absolutely right. I mean, it's never too late to reclaim your health. However, you know, an ounce of prevention is a, is worth a pound of cure. And, you know, your 20s are the time to set those habits. So a lot of people's health, um, nutrition, substance habits are formed um, in their 20s. And so this is absolutely the time to, you know, take up that hobby, whatever, whether it's tennis or running or rock climbing. I mean, this is the time to get that started so that you might continue it as you get older. It's the time to think seriously about substance use and how that might be negatively impacting right. your body or your lifestyle, um, nutrition. And these are a lot of things that most young people understandably have taken for granted because it's just like they're fall out of bed and they're healthy. Um, but that starts to change. And so your 20s are the time to lay the foundation for being healthy in your 30s, 40s, 50s. Yeah, completely. That's so essential. That focus, part of our podcast really has that um, um, that perspective of health and, and wellness for people, oh, for the Gen Zs, because um, you never know. You never know. Some some are very you know into it, but other people, you know, they want to, but they say, "Oh, I can do it later," etc. So, so it's very right. interesting. And um, so we usually have this question for all of our guests. It's a little bit personal, but hopefully oh, uh, right. you enjoy enjoy it. Um, so, in your life, what have you found that ignites the flame within and propels you to tap into your untapped sources of internal energy, or as we like to call it, energy, in order to uncover that innate mental, physical, and spiritual ability? Um, I would definitely say, you won't be surprised hearing this coming from a psychologist, it's helping other people, connecting with other people. That's really what creates the energy. Yeah. I mean, I love how you're, you're focusing on that, but I write books for a living. And one reason I do that is so that, you know, it's not just people who can afford a therapy session who get you know, the, the help that's out there for them. It's people who can, you know, have a library card that yeah. they can get that too. But what I notice is if I'm working too much on writing and I'm not talking face to face with 20 somethings like yourself or my clients mm -hmm. or my students, I kind of lose the energy, even though I love 
writing the books. And so that was actually part of what got me back on the ship last year for semester at sea is I just wanted to be around um, 20 somethings and get to know them and, you know, really feel their energy, but also, you know, selfishly get to benefit from the energy of what it's like to help people um, and how, how easy it is to help 20 somethings and how much they appreciate it, um, that it's, it's a wonderful kind of way to work and it's a great way to live. Absolutely. I think it's a definitely fair way to be selfish, uh, to want to help others. <laughs> it's amazing. Okay. So we have one last question and it's really, okay. what is that last nugget of wisdom uh, for anyone in our twenties? Um, you know, the one that's on my mind today is don't forget about the power of thinking small. And so that might surprise you because the defining decade in a way might feel like, you know, think big that's and, true. you know, go for it. But a lot, a lot of the messages in there are about, it's really the small things you do in your 20s that pay off over time. It's like making early investments and letting them pay off across 10, 20, 30 years. Um, and so I think right now in the pandemic, people may hear about the defining decade or read it and say, well, I can't define my decade. I'm stuck <laughs> at home. I can't get a good job. Yeah, I can't do true. anything. But it's usually, it's the little things, you know, it's that person you happen to meet even online, or it's that certification class you took that you weren't planning on, but you were stuck at home, or it's, um, you know, that book you picked up because, you know, the pandemic was happened and you're, you're reading more, or it's walking more, running more because the pandemic happened. And there are usually little things we do in our 20s that end up being extremely valuable over time. And so to not feel like you have to do it all and slay it all and have it all figured out by 30, I'm actually talking about do small things that are good for you and they're going to pay off over time. Amazing, amazing. Well, Meg, uh, it was really a pleasure. I'm so thankful for you writing this book and having it uh, around for people our age. Hopefully they read it in time. Uh, and it's really, it's really a, a beautiful thing to have sort of more of a direction for, for people our age and, and see that there is opportunity and there is time also, you know, there is small things that we can, we can think. Absolutely. Well, thanks for doing what you're doing. I, I'm, I'm a fan. I love the podcast already. So thank you. Uh -huh. And it was great to talk to you. Absolutely.